Hello, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome today, happy Rare Disease Day 2023. Um, today, we're really excited to have a very special broadcast uh, on narcolepsy and art, the intersection between creativity and, um, and, and a, a journey living with narcolepsy. Uh, so I'm super excited um, to uh, have this discussion. And let me go ahead and pull up the slides. So we'll start with some housekeeping, Lauren. Uh, hey, everybody. So great to see you today and excited for this discussion. Um, before we get started, just a couple little housekeeping things. Um, as you're tuning in, if you want to share your state or country where, where you're um, joining us from in the chat. We love to see where everybody is. Um, if you want to like and comment and share this and uh, share the video, that helps us reach uh, even more people. And just remember that the video and the comments are going to be um, public and the video is being recorded and it will be available later. So only put anything in the comments that you would want everybody to see. Um, please send in any questions or thoughts that you have, that anything that sparks your interest or curiosity um, into the comments. We'll try to have some Q&A later uh, with our guests. And just remember that um, our narcolepsy nerd alert broadcasts are for educational purposes. Um, we can't give any medical advice. So if anything that comes up that um, you, know, you have questions about your own uh, medical situation, we ask that you bring those to your neurologist or sleep specialist. Um, after today's broadcast, we're going to build a toolkit, um, just distilling all of the wonderful insights shared and um, bringing everybody's um, art pieces that they're sharing together. So look out for that coming soon. Thank you, Lauren. So we're so excited to have some really amazing guests and artists here with us today. Uh, if you guys wanna go ahead and introduce yourself really quickly, starting with Ulrika. Hi, I'm from Sweden. It's not really true. I'm from Germany, but I'm living in Sweden, north of Stockholm, since uh, 16 years. It's 1900 here. That means seven in the evening. It's pretty dark and cold. Ah, well, thank you so much for joining us all the way from Sweden. Silence. Thank you so much for having me. Hi, I'm from Tennessee. I'm originally from Florida. It's lunchtime here, so um Dixon Tennessee to be exact so very cool thanks for being here uh Shu is not with us in person but uh Shu is in Japan and we're really excited to share about his art uh next Jonathan hello I'm Jonathan Korea I'm in Virginia in Shindle Valley um it's sorry Ulrika that it's unpleasant there it's pretty warm and sunny here uh <laughs> unusual end of March weather, or end of February weather, but um, I'm glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, we also have Dana's art that we'll share today from um, Israel, uh, but she's not with us in person today. And then we have Jaden. Hello. Um, so I'm Jaden. Uh, I'm from Oklahoma, and um, it's about lunchtime around now and the weather's been crazy we've had like 15 tornadoes around the state so oh. yeah one time oh my goodness that's scary um all right well thank you guys so much for being here um and we have a question for the audience what's the relationship between narcolepsy and creativity uh so is that you know does narcolepsy impact your creativity uh, does having creative expression impact your experience with narcolepsy at all? So please, please, please go ahead and respond to that uh, prompt if you'd like in the comments. Uh, we'd just love to hear different people's perspectives on that. Uh, and we're gonna go ahead and get started uh, sharing some different artworks. Um, we've asked each of our uh, featured artists today to share one piece, uh, which I imagine is even in itself kind of challenging maybe to choose one piece to share. Um, so we gave them a tough job um, and we're going to go ahead and start with Shu. Uh, Shu Holike lives in Japan and is a freelance designer, web engineer, and digital art director. 
he creates glitch art using digital photography and an app called Glitche, as well as another app and his own effort and using his own effects of through Photoshop. His work expresses the specific feelings of narcolepsy and hypersomnia. And this piece represents fear of memories being sliced out. It also expresses the anxiety of shaking vision, distorted sounds, and feeling uncomfortable under the gaze of others. Shu says, I feel that the malfunction caused by this disruption of electrical signals, which was a common abnor abnormality in old machines, is very similar to my narcolepsy. Recently, I found that creepy sounds like analog synth, electronic musical instruments like moog or boot cloth or distorted guitar might be resonating with signals in my brain. I've listened to the industri industrial rock band Nine Inch Nails since I was a teenager, and my works are inspired by their music. Other artists, graphic designers, and film directors who inspire me are Rob Sheridan, Russell Mills, David Carson, and David Fincher. Shu is a member of the Japanese Narcolepsy Association and hopes to use his art to raise awareness of narcolepsy in Japan. And you can see more of his work and narcolepsy awareness efforts on Instagram. Uh, and down here on the slide, we have his Instagram handle uh, as well. So just such a cool piece. Uh, it just really strikes me and, and really resonates um, as a fellow person with narcolepsy and a major art appreciator. So thank you, Shu, for sharing. All right, Erica, do you want to go ahead and share about your piece? Yes, um, the art piece I chose for today's podcast is uh, one of 30 staged photographies, which I named um, My Beautiful Nightmares. Um, the works cover the borderline between dream and reality. And uh, as you might guess, it's a project on hypnagogic hallucinations and sleep paralysis. Um, before I continue, I really need to highlight the previous podcast you had on this topic um, about hypnagogic hallucinations. It was amazing for me to hear the three speakers describing what I until now only could show in images. I have this barrier inside. Uh, I have in fact never ever told anyone in 12 and a half years about the content of my hallucinations. Uh, when narcolepsy came into my life, uh, it was like being bitten by a poisonous spider. It was so sudden and I was just so terrified and very confused. I was 38 years old, uh, two small children. Um, I had two jobs at the same time and previously I lived in Shanghai and before that in India and my daughter is born in Bombay, you know, this whole life and this just didn't fit in. It kind of my world collapsed. Uh, and I had never ever heard about narcolepsy before and my doctor apparently neither. So I lived with the wrong medical diagnosis for a very long time and when I when I finally diagnosed with Taiwan, the, the damage was kind of done. I, I was an insecure people with, uh, with shame. I lost trust in everything, in my body and relations and, of course, in authorities. Um, it's been some years and quite some work, but I got my stability back and uh, if you're guessing now how, I bet you're wrong because it's it's the elephant. <laughs> it gives me everything, strength and belief and peaceful moments. So in my art and maybe you see here at the back uh, in my room, um, the elephant is my master motive and he's everywhere. I wish you could come and see in my studio. I generally love to create beautiful, charming and cute images. And I have the brightest colors, rainbow and coral, cor coral reef all over. Um, but uh, I'm also of an imaginary and experimental kind. And that brings me back to 
this project. Two years ago, there was this artist call, um, and the question was uh, how you would interpret interpret a border or borderline. And I, I immediately immediately visualized this borderline between dream and reality, between sleep and wakefulness. And it was completely clear. I, I had the whole project done in my head uh, within one day. But what I did, uh, I, I asked my kids for items, uh, teddy bears and dolls and key rings and all kinds of things, plastic jewelry. And then I started to work for about six weeks. I built I built sculptures. Uh, they were uneasy, but they were also beautiful. I included wooden hands, which I styled, and makeup dolls and masks. And in the end, and to meet the exhibition requirements, I photographed the scenes and I printed them on aluminium sheets. So what you see in my staged photographs is the result of the process. And um, this artwork may create feelings of uneasiness, and this is intended, of course. But what is most important for me, it's not the result, but the process itself. The process itself changed a lot, uh, because some of the beasts, I, I say, went on a sabbatical. And you won't believe it, they have not come back. Thank you. Wow, Ulrika, this is just so powerful. Um, I think just looking at it for the last few minutes, I realized the mask in the background here, right? Is that a, mm. oof, that's just incredibly powerful. Mm. Thank you so much for sharing this. Uh, and you. about the elephant, I wanna see some of this coral um, <laughs> bright art too. That sounds really amazing as well. So, all right, we'll have time for more discussion after. So we're just gonna continue here. Uh, next, we have Silence Hand. Silence Hands is a mother of two and a multidisciplinary artist from Tennessee. She was diagnosed with type one narcolepsy with cataplexy at age 35 and wishes to motivate others to listen closely to what their bodies are telling them. She's also a speaker with Project Sleep's Rising Voices program where Silence shares her experience with others to improve awareness of narcolepsy and hopes to undo misconceptions of this neurological condition. Silence, share about the piece here. Sorry, I had to figure out the mute. Um, yeah, so, um, Usually for me, creating a piece is very playful. Um, I like to make a lot of revisions of things, photograph, go back, play. Um, and this is the first beginning of a series that I'm doing um, that kind of intentionally involves narcolepsy. Um, I think a lot of my work before, I, until I was diagnosed and I kind of looked back through my algorithm, so to speak, I realized there was a lot of components of my experiences with narcolepsy. So now um, I'm taking it slow and I'm rebuilding new art. And this piece um, has taken me about five months to create because it arrives with my shipment of treatment. So it's gonna keep growing and growing and uh, I wanted to photograph it in the space where I work most, my kitchen. I love to cook. Um, so it's really important to showcase it here. And can you, I, I don't, I know what, I, I know exactly what you mean about your shipment of medicine because I think I get the same shipment. Um, but can you just point out where that is in the art? That is the art. That's the, the sculpture itself is the packing. So each month I get two pieces and I have to wait another month to get two more pieces. And um, in a couple of years, maybe I'll have something big enough. To put, um, sorry, my lights are automatic. <laughs> um, maybe I'll have something you know large enough to put in a gallery space. So this is gonna continue to grow. And I think that's the most interesting part of it is as my brain 
rewires my peace grows and it's this interesting relationship that is going on now with my art intentionally so did you choose the colors of the um you know how you've I guess painted the those intentional at all or yes that's the color of the sun so <laughs> oh I love it I'm just a little bit afraid what happens when you if you were ever to be on like I've been on <laughs> treatment for 15 years <laughs> it, it might get quite big <laughs> yeah and and the interesting thing is like most of my work was very big so it's been it's been new to work so slowly and to you know have something so small but I'm really excited to see like as it grows like what the process is I mean this is going to change and change and change and you kind of got to trust the art and see where it takes you. That is so cool and then for you wearing blue is that symbolic of anything or? Um, so there was a big discussion on this blue or yellow. <laughs> I, I originally did yellow um, and I did a poll. And it, it's created quite the hot debate between um, age brackets, which, which I thought was really interesting. Um, but I thought, you know, blue is a very sleepy color. It's very, they, you know, they paint hospitals blue. Um, it's very calming. And so this treatment is what charges me. So it's not a part of me, but it is a component of me. So I wanted to make myself separate from the component yeah and did you do that poll on instagram or on <laughs> no, no. Oh. i have a lot of uh friends that i that i speak to old and young and it was funny the older group said blue because of the contrast and the younger group said yellow so that's funny well then you kind of know both are good i i uh somewhat differently but um when i was trying to come up with a name for my book um, I pulled friends and people had really different opinions, which made you, I guess it made it a little bit more confusing. I was hoping everyone would agree <laughs> there'd be one standout, but then it made me feel like, well, <laughs> you know, different, different things for different people sometimes resonate differently. Um, yeah. This is really great. Is there anything else you want to share at this point or? No, thank you. Okay. All right, Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan Correa is a photography hobbyist and outdoor enthusiast. He was diagnosed with narcolepsy in 2014, more than 10 years after his initial symptoms. Jonathan is a lifelong resident of the Shenandoah, Shenandoah, Shenandoah. Shenandoah I think, Doe, Valley in Virginia. Share about your piece. And I think it has a really cool name too, doesn't it? Yes, this is Dream Lake. Um, so I have... Uh, on World Narcolepsy Day, uh, I always try to do a, a special hike um, or a trip. And this year, I believe this was in uh, 21, um, it was a, the weather was nasty. I couldn't uh, go outdoors. So I went to um, a place nearby called Luray Caverns. And I had been there several years before, but I didn't remember everything. And, uh, but I took all my um, photography gear, uh, just in case. And I came across this feature called Dream Lake. I had completely forgotten about, um, but ended up being perfect. And um, I, I didn't know in such a low light situation how it was going to turn out. And with film, you don't have any way of knowing until uh, until you develop it. So it was kind of a scary process. Um, spending all the time I did uh, trying to get it just right, uh, trying to get the, the composition perfect and, or were right for me anyway. And, uh, and I was pretty, pretty pleased with how it turned out. Um, uh, I lost my train of thought. I had something else I wanted to say about it and I forgot. Well, maybe you'll remember. I was just gonna ask, what are these um, these things? Well, those, uh, what is it that, uh, I don't I, I can't remember now on the spot whether it's stalagmites or stalactites that hang from, from the ceiling, um, but it's a reflection. Of course, it's a, a water feature. So you've got a reflection 
um, underneath. Um, it is so cool. But I was thinking about this photo. Actually, um, I thought about you when I uh, was trying to find my shirt. Uh, I have my um, my care for rare shirt uh, with my zebra. I I saw your panda socks yesterday, <laughs> but I I thought about uh, black and white in particular. How odd it is. Uh, I guess the the correlation with the the zebra and and the interest in black and white photography in particular. And and then I realized. I don't even really think of it when I'm when I'm shooting. I don't even think of it in black and white. Be, even when I develop it, it's I'm thinking about it in colors still because you, um, I mean, you're compensating for for all the colors with with filters. The light is interacting with all the different colors. So even filming black and white it's still uh, it feels colorful. Um, you can sense all the. Uh, the tones still. Were you, were you always into photography or do you think, you know, has this, um, did your narcolepsy journey impact that at all or? Well, uh, I have always been interested, um, uh, I guess since high school, uh, been interested in photography and then slowly um, evolved from digital to the film. Um, but I don't know that I really, um, that my narcolepsy, at least not consciously that it, that it affects my work. I should say that I'm not consciously thinking of it in terms of, um, what I'm photographing or, um, you know, that I guess it's not inspiring it necessarily, but it certainly affects it in a big way because um, a lot of these uh, locations, a lot of the shoots that I do are, um, I mean, it's really time consuming. Uh, they're most of the time all day shoots um, and it's very patient. You have to be patient, especially with the film. Um, so it, it it really affects my narcolepsy when when you have an all day shoot and especially when you're on in a location that's uh, pretty secluded and you don't have the opportunity to take a nap or you've got a long day you've had an early morning or something. Um, I mean it's really had a. Um, I I really feel the the connection with my narcolepsy in that sense. Do you think being, than, out, being out in nature is part of um, something that you value? Oh, definitely. It it's um, it's really for me, uh, I guess, uh, kind of a spiritual experience. It's um, it's pretty powerful, uh, especially um, some of these scenes right here, just in my backyard. That uh, some people might go their their whole lives not even uh, not even realizing are there. Um, but it, it's a, well, you're inspiring. Yeah. You're inspiring me to get out more in the California. <laughs> There's so much beauty all around us, and so that's I need to I need to get out more. <laughs> I might well, not do uh, the film photography, but <laughs> and one of my biggest it. inspirations is Ansel Adams, and seeing all of his work in California and in, uh, the the grandeur of the the um, scenery out there, um, it's, uh, it's pretty special. Yeah, we have to come visit. Yeah. We have a lot of snow right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's unusual for us in LA. All right, anything else you wanna share at this point? Um, you know, I, I kinda wanna plug, um, Narcolepsy Network for just a second because my um, the nurse practic practitioner who treats my narcolepsy, Ellen Wormter, is speaking with Narcolepsy Network tomorrow. They're featuring her in a, a lifestyle webinar. So uh, oh, cool. I was pretty surprised. I haven't seen her for several months, and I was pretty surprised to see that on on one of their posts. So uh, just wanted to throw that out. <laughs> 
Awesome. Yeah, we do have a slide mentioning them as well. That's exciting. Sounds like a good event. Um, okay, well, next we have Jaden. Your bio. Jaden Rowland is an art major at Oklahoma Community College who was diagnosed with type 1 narcolepsy with cataplexy at age 15 and has been raising awareness ever since. As an artist and speaker with Project Sleep's Rising Voices program, Jaden conveys the struggles of not being taken seriously, achieving a diagnosis, and their ongoing battle with depression and self-acceptance. Jaden, we're so excited to have you share. Okay, so um, when I developed narcolepsy at the age of 15, I believe that my art became more than just a talent. Um, it became sort of like an outlet for self-expression, art therapy, and a sort of like a coping mechanism. So um, now I want to utilize it to reflect my deepest and innermost emotions, as well as my personal struggle with narcolepsy. And um, this particular comic, I'm in college right now, and uh, it just showcases a lot of the, you know, struggles that can happen, you know, day to day, trying to make sure you get all the work done. And um, so for my future of my art, as I gain more knowledge through the courses in college, um, I'm gradually beginning to build more of like a storyline. I am to create a graphic novel and eventually an animated film that rises to the level of visual storytelling of Studio Ghibli. That may sound like an ambitious goal and maybe it is, but I've been wanting to convey this idea for a long time. Um, it will focus on my struggles with narcolepsy, the uncertainty, uncertainty of reality between the dream realm and the working, uh, the waking wo world, sorry. <laughs> uh, depression and um, uh, most of all, uh, it's uh, going to be like through the uh, rose colored lens of a magical girl inspired worldview, which um, relates to anime, which you can see in the background. So um, I also love a bunch of pastel colors. So it's just going to be, you know, cutesy, but kind of like with a more serious overtone, you know. So yeah. Oh my gosh, I think that's so amazing, Jaden. I feel like uh, there are so many aspects of narcolepsy that are a little fantastical or you know um, yeah. that being able to like access that realm is so cool and and uh, visually there's so much you could do um I also just want to thank you for like being vulnerable talking about things like um you know depression and and I think I, I read about storytelling all the time because I'm kind of obsessed with it um big big story nerd and they always really talk about how, you know, those vulnerabilities, the things that we don't always talk about, those are the things that really do connect us all. Um, mm -hmm. And so being, being really specific and sharing your experience, it like, that's really what so many people um, will find themselves in that, even if they don't have narcolepsy, you know? So yeah. um, I, I don't think that it's too ambitious. You're dreamers and we got to make those dreams come true. So we are cheering big time for that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, anything... I forgot oh. about uh, saying who my um, favorite artist was. Can I say that real quick? Um, yeah. So my favorite artist is uh, Camilla Dierko. She's a, um, a painter slash graphic art, uh, novel artist. And um, a lot of her art inspires me. And now that I know how to, like, I'm starting to paint, you know, like, it's not, it's going to take a while, but you know, but her art is really, um, really cool. She's got like a whole website. You can go check it out. Oh, cool. Well, I have to get that in the comments so people can check it out. Yeah, her um, art is so inspired. Sorry. <laughs> when you said something, you said it, um, the thing that you thought the graphic novel would be like, it's not, I forget the, oh. hmm? uh, you said that you were um, in the, in the realm of uh something oh I can't um remember. it's um so I have a lot of uh so my dreams are extremely realistic sometimes I can't tell the difference between reality and the dream realm because I feel everything that you you know the waking realm is like you know all the senses and stuff and even pain at times it's crazy so um yeah I've had some crazy dreams <laughs> so I wanted to incorporate that into um 
like I said, a Studio Ghibli kind of like inspired story that's just like in the dream realm mostly, like crossing between both. Is that what Studio Ghibli is? Um, no, Studio Ghibli is a um, animation studio that has a lot of different films that are animated, but the um, general like vibe of it is just magical and just like this entire magical journey in most, you know, most of the films. So it's cool. Sounds perfect. Perfect fit. Mm -hmm. Thank oh, yeah. you for educating me too. This is really cool. <laughs> yeah. Anything else you want to share about the piece? Um, hmm. No, it, it, it conveys itself <laughs> pretty much. Yeah. I think I just really like comics because, you know, I can convey entire, like, you know, ideas. It's so cool. And thank you for all. You've done some really um, beautiful art during the sleep in, too. In the past. I don't remember. I, I think I did. Yeah. That's been a while. <laughs> yeah. I love it. All right. Let's see. Oh, next we have Dana's piece. Uh, Dana Harrell lives in Israel with her husband and two children. She is a de developmental psychologist and an artist. She was diagnosed with type one narcolepsy with cataplexy at age 34 after living with symptoms since she was 18. Her artwork primarily involves paper craft, scrapbooking and mixed media. This piece represents the two types of narcolepsy, type one narcolepsy with cataplexy and type two narcolepsy without cataplexy. On the left side of Dana's piece, cataplexy and the other symptoms related to REM stage sleep, a cheerful, happy, excited little girl enjoys her colorful life. She is climbing high, laughing, playing without fear, giving free rein to her emotions, ignoring demons and all the warning signs that come from all over. Watch out, little girl, you are playing roulette. She knows she is taking a risk and all her joy and laughter and emotion can in one moment make the whole celebration end. I just personally love the, you know, I thought that I heard you laughing. Oof, just haunts me every time. On the right side, boredom and the complex relationship of sleep and wakefulness. The man is a silhouette in the dark with circuits all over his body. The dream, D-R-E-A-M, falls apart and the puzzle pieces don't fit together anymore. The proper connection between sleep and wakefulness has been lost. The man is handcuffed. He feels bound. In between the raindrops, the rain doesn't stop. The umbrella is already in tears. The ghost is sitting on his shoulder and doesn't want to leave. Some bright stars and moon give some light. And in some of the cracks are written the symptoms that characterize his disorder such a powerful piece and thank you so much to Dana in Israel for sharing this with us. Lastly, we have Solomon Briggs. Um, we're really excited to include a piece of his art today as well. Solomon is a patient advocate, author, and artist. He is also a skateboarder, snowboarder, and ice hockey player and cooks according uh, and cooks accordingly for the strict allergies he lives with. He talks about his narcolepsy experience frequently on social media and has published several books about his life with type one narcolepsy and other invisible illnesses. They're available on Amazon under the name narcoplexic, a combination of the terms narcolepsy and cataplexy. Solomon says about this piece, my, my art is directly inspired by the broken sleep that I live with and the abstract realm I must live in. I try hard to express and portray actual elements of living with the difficult, complex, rare, and invisible disease, type one narcolepsy, plus two other sleep disorders. This piece portrays both excessive daytime sleepiness and mild or moderate cataplexy. This is really powerful. Um, I have a piece of Solomon's art myself um, here at my house. So uh, thank you to Solomon for for sharing this piece. I kind of feel like since I was an art history major, I kind of want to give my, you know, like two cents and everything. I'm just really struck by these, these dark lines here. I feel like I can feel, uh, a, you know, a darkness, a pulling sort of like a pain in, in the fall um, of his neck here. 
So um, there's just so many different aspects of narcolepsy that, you know, I think um, you guys have explored through your art. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead uh, and stop the sharing of the slides right now uh, so we can see everybody. Uh, and um, I do want to check in with Lauren and, and hear what's happening on the chat. Um, and, and if people have uh, any questions, uh, do you want to um, go ahead and share right now, Lauren? Yeah, so tons of wonderful comments um, coming in. Just so many people appreciating your your all of your work and how much it resonates with them. Um, we had some great comments. Um, Taylor just kind of generally saying um, how narcolepsy forced her to slow down and gave her the chance to reconnect with her creative side and how creating brings her joy even when she's struggling with symptoms. Um, and then um, folks just talking about how particular pieces resonated with them. So um, Juan in Florida uh, about Ulrich's piece said, you know, that his, um, it, it struck a chord with him and the fear, you know, having to get used to the fear of shadows and the strangeness of being half in a dream and, and half waking um, and how that resonated with him. And then silence, um, you know, folks were impressed with how, you, like the, the originality of your art and how it's, it's a living piece, how it grows over time and how Amazing it is how we put ourselves into art and how um, how that grows with us over time. Um, and then um, Jonathan, uh, Amy in Richmond says she loves to hike the Shenandoah Valley. And um, so me too. So you've got a lot of love from Virginia here. <laughs> and um, I, th I think you talked a little bit about this, but um, there's some curiosity about how your pictures are developed. So maybe, um, maybe we can go back into that a little bit. Um, and then Jaden, um, your your bestie Sadie is here supporting you. So thank you to Sadie um, for being here. <laughs> um, and then uh, everybody was just saying how cool a Studio Ghibli style piece would be um, and how animation just allows things that aren't possible in other mediums. And we all really wanna see what you might do. <laughs> so thank you everybody for your comments and keep them coming. Yeah, Jonathan, you want to start with answering that question? And I have some questions. I don't know if anyone on the chat has asked any questions yet, but we'll keep checking there too. Well, um, I have a, a small canister. Um, it it uh, will fit four sheets of film in it. There are two. Um, well, can I get it? It's right outside the door. Can I get it real quick? Sure. I'll be right back. Sure. <laughs> It's pretty awesome. He was telling us about his dark room at home. Oh, major points, Jaden, on, on the sweatshirt. Oh, yeah. Okay, so. This one. This one. Um, each of these will hold two. Uh, two sheets of film, one on each side. Then they go in this canister, and as the lid, I don't have the um, uh, the caps right now. But you insert the, uh, you pour in the um, developer, and well, it's got different stages. Um, I rinse mine first and then I develop and then you've got a, there are three different stages. There's the develop and then there's the stop to stop the development and then there's the fix to uh, kind of seal it. And then after, I mean, really that process, depending on, it all depends on how you shot the film, really how long it takes, but anywhere from, I guess, seven to 15 minutes. Um, and then you let it dry out um, for, I don't know, it could take up to a couple of hours for it to completely dry unless you try to manually dry it. But uh, that photo in particular, I um, after I developed it, I scanned it in. I've got a um, pretty nice photo scanner um, and then can uh, manipulate it in uh, in Lightroom is what I use, Adobe Lightroom. Um, adjust the, the contrast. 
So but, you don't uh, have those big, um, so basically you don't have to have those big, then you print it digitally then? Well, you don't have um, those big baths so, where you like, you know, do those things and then. Yeah, I do have the bins for printing. So that's my development. Uh, that's how I develop just the, uh, just the film. This is another photo, but uh, that's the sheet of film itself. It's four by five. Um, but then to actually print it, I have um, an enlarger. Um, oh, wow. Which I used to cut this old fashioned. Um, yep. I took brain. photography in high school. I remember these elements. <laughs> <laughs> so I've slowly over the last few years, I've been developing. <laughs> I, I don't know, intentionally using that as a pun, but uh, I've been developing my dark room, so. Uh, we like anyway, puns here, we're nerds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Um, I was curious from, this is a question I have for everybody and I did not prep you on this, so no, no worries if you don't really have a response, but um, you know, there are so many aspects to living with narcolepsy. Uh, that it can be sort of overwhelming to even when someone asks like what is it like to live with narcolepsy uh oh my god I like there's so many things come to mind uh where do you even start and then kind of like I don't know <laughs> um so that's why of course that we've developed rising voices and trying to get people structured to sharing their story um via presentation um but you know uh with art especially visual arts which is we did you know, when we were thinking about this broadcast, we even did think, well, should we go further? Should we include film and um, some different things? And we kind of ended up going more with just visual art for this um, broadcast. Uh, but if, so if you think about visuals, do you think there are aspects of narcolepsy that really lend themselves very easily um, to visual representations? Uh, and are there other areas that seem more challenging or, you know, you almost kind of want to figure out a way to visually represent um, like for me as a writer, I know that um, uh, talking about uh, writing scenes about like the sleepiness uh, and even the cataplexy came somewhat naturally to me, but trying to get across my hypnagogic hallucinations felt more challenging uh, in a written format. So I don't know if you guys um, feel like any areas um, have been easy and some are uh, more challenging or more interesting to you guys. Anybody got thoughts, Jaden? Yeah. Um, so with that story idea that I talked about earlier, um, some of the dreams that I've had that are hyper-realistic are um, kind of hard to depict in art, like visual art. So um, I'm currently trying to figure out how to like character design certain things because, <laughs> you know, every time I try to draw it, it's like, it's just, not coming together correctly so i'll figure it out but <laughs> so yeah that's one difficult thing i um uh, personally i think video helps um with some of that like i like to that's why i always say multidisciplinary because sculpture is such a loaded thing <laughs> um but um, recently I've been doing this thing where, because I, I was always curious when I would explain my dreams to other people, like how they were translating them. Mm -hmm. And so everybody has this big division with the AI thing, like you either love it or you hate it. <laughs> but I think it's an interesting tool. So I've been telling AI my dreams and letting mm -hmm. it try to like show me what it thought that I dreamed and then making sculptures from that and it's it's been pretty interesting because it's just another it's just another way to get feedback from another thing that's trying to decipher what I'm telling it so oh, that is so cool it's very cool <laughs> wow I, I would like to do that, that. Well, Erica, I feel like you know your artwork so um you know, beautifully captured some of those hypnagogic hallucination, you know, experiences. Uh, so I guess I'm kind of curious if you find, you know, visual arts would be more challenging to capture different 
um, parts of the experience or any thoughts? It's like um, Jonathan and Silence said, it's um, the making something conscious or creating like unconscious because the when I go to my studio, I uh, I want to be the person I was before. Uh, narcolepsy is doesn't I I in my emotions say um, narcolepsy has no relation to to my art. Um, but then of course the thoughtful side says uh, everything is related to narcolepsy. I choose these um, bright uh, colors uh, to to match the dark side uh, or the dark sides i choose the big uh, canvases um, uh, i have these big uh, brushes because i'm always running behind uh, the time the time is my i always have to schedule everything like tonight mm -hmm. seven o'clock i have to count back when do i sleep when do i eat when do i this that and uh, sometimes when i'm in a flow i i can panic because i look at the clock and i know i uh, i know when my first sleeping time is and if i don't hold that uh, the whole day will not function and then i have to quickly finish something and sometimes the painting gets totally destroyed uh, sometimes it can be something really special i have this friend who um works with me and she she sometimes comes and says oh, Ulrike stop this is this painting is is fine stop just stop and if I don't um yeah it can be a total mess um mm -hmm. but um the other day I I really had a I really had a, a bad day I just went to the studio to you know to do something uh and I she asked me what are you going to paint today and I said ah, nothing maybe some squirrel, squirrels, squirrels, and I, I, it took me 15 minutes and I painted two squirrels on this one meter canvas, two one meter canvas in 15 minutes. And they were, they were ready. They were, you know, nothing to add. And then I'm like, wow, uh, it just comes out of me. It's like putting it on the, the canvas and, and that's, that's amazing. I think I I try to use my condition. Uh, sometimes it's like now I see what happens. But I, I also have to de-romanticize this uh, uh, being an artist because um, there are so many other aspects to if it's a business, if it's a job, you have to do your finance, your public relations, your networking, your everything. Um, there's uh, always too little time <laughs> that's my that's my that's what squeezes me here but uh i i learned to deal with it i, I learned to deal with it i think that's so powerful i i i hear two things there that really resonate with me and i imagine with other people uh even that um aren't artists is somewhat accepting the flow of you know uh <laughs> Uh, of creativity and then also how that fits in with the structure of narcolepsy um, and uh, that, you know, turning away from things at certain points and maybe the painting is done, but maybe you want to keep going, um, but then knowing like that you have to stop and, and take your medicine. Um, and then also just, I am curious people's thoughts about the idea of, of finishing something. Cause I, I do feel like, um, uh that when you have less maybe overall energy that we have certain bursts of creativity possibly but then sometimes those fade uh, or wakeful and maybe the creativity doesn't but the wakefulness does um and there can that can add up and and possibly give people a sense of um like they're not able to finish things um they start projects but maybe don't finish and um you know you guys have just showed such beautiful art but i don't know if you guys have you know so that everyone knows that maybe everyone sort of feels like that at times um are there are things that you guys have felt like um you know projects that have been half done or um certain things you've just i don't know maybe that's but i i do think that would probably resonate with people if there are any examples 
Definitely. I'm not it. Like <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. I I have uh, I could make this um, exhibition of unfinished paintings. It's like I think I have 80, 90 unfinished. Um, but what I do is I I paint with acrylic colors that dry very fast. So I just paint over and over. And uh, I had uh, a few paintings which were weighing really they were so heavy because they were like five six paintings underneath so i just go over them but um i don't know if that was the answer to the question but um uh, there are many things that are kind of never being finished generally in life but mm. also in my projects but i learned to be happy with um things I finish you know I have this list and if it's just one uh, what do you say uh, I can be uh, satisfied or happy yeah I like that idea of the gallery of unfinished work um, you know there are some fun especially here in LA I think there's like a gallery of torture a gallery of uh, you know um, dyed love you know he's like we could do a gallery of unfinished work uh, yeah. raise awareness about narcotics but that's but it's part of the experience but not the full but i i um thank you for sharing that because um i know that can uh be something that maybe people feel like it's you know they're not good enough but um i know one thing for me uh, a recent project i decided to write a film script which i'd never done before um and a little bit of i made it a social thing for myself of, of sharing it with other people i had to share it and it kind of became a social and so it wasn't just me alone and then if i didn't finish it but i was like i really want to prove i can um you know to some friends and so um that <laughs> i don't know if that's a good motivation or not but it did help me finish at least the first draft <laughs> but... Jaden, were you going to say something or oh um no I just said, yeah, I agree with you. I was going to say something. Um, I was just going to say that for me, um, experimentation is really crucial because a lot of times you have this idea in your head and no matter what you do, it doesn't translate the way that you want it. You don't see it the same. It's just not the same thing. Mm -hmm. So I try to focus on the idea of what I'm doing and just do different versions of it or play with like different materials and the more I experience, like I experiment, the more the art starts to take on a life of its own. And I start to create things that I didn't expect that are way better than anything I could have intentionally created. So I think that the art is in a weird way, like creating itself at the same time. So I think like trusting in the experimentation and and, and I used to do that thing where I was like, it's not done. Is it done? Is it not done? Like, and I would panic. And I like the way I work now because there's no expectations. Because it's, it's hard to, I'm never going to accomplish what I think I'm going to accomplish. And sometimes that's better. So. And I think the experimentation, um, I think that's a good uh, point to make about narcolepsy too is um, not to, that in, experimentation is probably necessary for a lot of people that you, you're not gonna find the right thing um, all at once, uh, you know, the right treatment or the right solution for you or uh, it might take a while. But then when you get it, it's beautiful. <laughs> uh okay well i'm over here having chills and good uh, goosebumps i think is the word goosebumps and uh tearing up because i think that is just so such a powerful way of thinking about it i think mm -hmm. all of life if we could think of it more of an experiment um both narcolepsy everything um uh, art um it lends itself to much more play and um like you said silence like no expectations or hopefully lowering <laughs> expectations of of what that means um yeah that just really really resonates with me um lauren i don't know if there's any questions coming over on the chat 
Um, we have one question from Taylor, which I think is really interesting. And I don't know if anybody's ever tried this, but um, have you ever been able to, or had tried to like depict different, um, like people always say like, I'm so tired. Have you ever thought about or tried to depict like different types of tired, if that makes sense, like sleepiness versus fatigue or anything like that? If I don't know. I haven't, but that um, seems to relate to what Julie asked earlier about the different aspects of narcolepsy that would seem more difficult to, to portray. Because mm -hmm. um, I, I was thinking that would be one of the most difficult uh, for me, definitely would be sleepiness or, or in, I can't, I can't even picture how I would portray that through, and certainly not through the photography that I normally do, but something like, um, um, like sleep paralysis or the hypnagogic hallucination would be, uh, I mean, I, I can see that I didn't in, when I took my photograph of Dream Lake, I didn't intend to take it with anything in mind about uh, portraying narcolepsy, but as I uh, edited it, it, it really kind of sucked me in. I could really feel, um, it really made me feel kind of the, uh, um, I get almost horror of, of how sleep paralysis feels, how uh, that whole experience, um, you, know, you can almost feel like you're getting drawn into the cave, like you're, you're um, into the unknown. Um, and in Ulrica's, uh, until Julie brought it up, I know I'm going off on a tangent, uh, kind of, I know. <laughs> but uh, until Julie pointed it out on Ulrica's um, piece, I, I didn't even notice the mask. But as soon as I did, it took me right back to the last time I experienced sleep paralysis. And, and I could feel I could feel it again, just seeing that mask. Um, that was pretty powerful. But the sleep oh, to me, going go back to what Lauren, <laughs> uh, Lauren said, the sleep to me would be one of the most difficult to, to portray. I was, I must admit that Taylor inspired my first question. So <laughs> you were right on that. Does anyone else have any thoughts about the different aspects of sleepiness and um, I've, I had an obsession uh, for a little while of drawing eyes, just, just eyes up close and then filling in the center uh, with different things um, and trying and like flame sort of, or uh, more like a marble looking. Uh, so that's something I've, I've thought about is just eyes in general, um, because often I think sleepiness is so invisible, like your eyes can be open, but you can feel uh, such that sucking or fiery feeling, but any, anyone else have thoughts on that? I've tried to portray something like that um, with video work and timing. Like I I tried to make the frame go a little faster than what I was going. Mm -hmm. um, I think if you if you play with, that's probably the easiest way for me to think of doing it. Um, but yeah, it's it's hard to just be like, I'm gonna make this thing just like this. <laughs> you know? But I think video work gives you the freedom to put the person in your body experiencing it. Any other thoughts on that? Um, I haven't done anything yet to describe stuff like that, but um, after hearing everybody's responses, um, I'm definitely going to think about it. I'm very creatively inspired about it. So. Yes, I love that. <laughs> and we have to keep checking back. Um, yeah, I was just thinking even how your pieces, like Jonathan, what you just described about your artwork, um, I kind of saw something different. <laughs> uh, to me, I saw kind of like uh, the surface of the water as like a line and just how active the reflection made the water feel. Like that the dream world of the, you know, that almost like all that stuff was coming up that I felt like the active dream world uh, was just so present in that photo sort of, if you envision that that was like 
but it's under the surface and that you usually wouldn't see it, but that it was so present there versus like, you know, maybe I thought of like real life as like the upper part. Um, mm -hmm. So I didn't even sense the anxiety, anxiety of like the closed environment. Although Lauren was describing this place to me um, <laughs> a little bit of the, the, cause it's kind of a cave, right? Right. It is. A, yeah. Which I think that I would feel a lot of anxiety. <laughs> Yeah, uh, of that present, you know, that feeling of uh, that resonates with the hypnagogic hallucination. So that was cool when you said that, but I'd seen something different. <laughs> and that's what's so great about uh, the art is that it's open. I mean, it's open to interpretation. I like what Silence said when um, before we went live about not over explaining um, her art because it, you don't, I, I guess I don't want to put into someone else's mind what I what I think they should feel about it. Uh, it's more of just letting them experience it and uh, and letting it affect them how I guess how how it naturally would. All right. Well I'm not a history major in which what we did was try to put meaning behind everything. <laughs> um, that's so cool. Um, do you, I don't try to think if I, I had one final question, um, unless does anyone have anything else they want to add or yeah. Jade. Uh, could I possibly show something I've been working on that relates to the story idea that I've been doing? Sure. Okay. Um, that's an art piece, but yeah, let me see if I can put you in um, bigger view so people can see it. Okay. <sighs> Cat is it catnap cafe? Uh cat catnip cafe. Yeah. Catnip cafe. I do a lot of like collages to convey like the entire meaning of things or common themes. And this is just a, like for the story idea in general about going through like the dream realm and stuff. So it's got like, you know, coffee and I put coffee in everything. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's just that's kind of like the art style I settled on. So yeah, and I, I love have, it. And I like how I, I put like a mirror of like a reflection of me. Um, so like there's this phrase that I came up with um, called a me that isn't me. Because um, I wish I like I have this. It's sad. <laughs> it's kind of like related to the depression thing, but I wish I wasn't who I am. So like with the narcolepsy and all that. But um, the moral of the story that I want to convey entirely is that um, no matter how many different versions of me there may be, um, all of them have problems. You know, it's not going to be completely perfect. I mean, that doesn't exist. So it's kind of just like a journey of self-acceptance in its entirety. So I thought that was cool. Oh, my God, that that resonates a lot. Um, I always, when people ask me about like dating with narcolepsy, you know, I, I, it's kind of a joke, but you know, at least I know what's wrong with me. <laughs> Everyone has their things, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I feel like I'm pretty aware of that, what one of mine is uh, possibly, um, <laughs> mm -hmm. but um, yeah, the journey of self-acceptance is evolving process that we all go through, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I was just reminded one more thing, Jonathan, when you talked about, you know, reading into things differently, um, the cover of my book, um, Wide Awake and Dreaming, my friend had given me an art print. Uh, I have the art print framed, but it's an art print kind of like, you know, it was very similar to this. Um, and she, what it reminded her of, is there was five balloons and we had five best friends. So it was that we each hold each other up. Uh, so that's why she gave it to me. She's one of my best college friends. Um, and so the five balloons represented for her, like our five best friends holding each other up through life. And I saw the same image, which I'm pretty sure was called dreaming, um, something very similar and was like, oh, well, she kind of looks like she could be having cataplexy or, um, a, you know, maybe asleep. Um, and so I actually did contact the artist, the original artist and asked her, you know, would you ever be willing to to have your art on a cover of a narcolepsy memoir. Uh, 
And um, actually turns out her grandmother had had narcolepsy and um, hadn't known her grandmother because she had passed away when she was very young, but mm -hmm. um, had had type one narcolepsy and she was really committed to the project and willing to adapt the drawing to look a little bit more like me. Um, and uh, it was just, you know, one of those experiences too, though, where both meanings were really beautiful, what my uh, friend had seen in it, um, but also for me, <laughs> what I saw and then getting to work with the artists. So. Um, that reminds me a lot of that. Uh, all right. Well, um, Lauren, is there anything else? I had one final question. Oh, just, um, well, first of all, that's so cool, Julie. I've known, I've known you for two and a half years and never knew that about your book cover. Oh, really? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I just wanted to just say that everybody in the comments, um, just kind of piggybacking off the self-acceptance and all the, you know, whatever challenges you have that people are just really um, enjoying hearing about your art and loving it. And um, Catherine commented, like, you know, whatever struggles you have, um, whatever self-doubt, um, you all have really special insights. So thank you so much. That's beautiful. Thank you. Um, I guess my last question, which again, I did not prepare you guys for, so you don't, if you don't want to say anything, that's fine. But I was just wondering if you had any um, advice for any young artists, um, you know, or, or people with narcolepsy um, that, you know, want to get more into art, if there's any sort of ad advice or mantra that you would share with them? I'm always going to have things to say. So I'm sorry <laughs> about that. <laughs> um, get rid of your expectations. Um, I think, like, just didn't want to bring up the pandemic, but I think one thing that the pandemic like taught me was to slow down, to get to know yourself. Don't try to fit into anybody else's box. Um, it's those things that you probably don't like about yourself that are really special that other people will like about you. And don't try to make everything perfect. <laughs> And I just want to add, I totally agree with you, Silence. And uh, I just want to add that um, you can make an impact despite or because of your condition. It's just that um, you have to to learn to put that internal internal inside of you. Um, this this meaning means a lot to me. Uh, I myself, uh, now I'm 50 years old, um, but I learned that only the first, uh, only a short while ago that, um, you know, when you have dreams and the dreams are uh, shattered, then you find, you have to find new dreams. You have to um, get back that strength, but it doesn't come overnight. It, uh, it took quite a long time. But I understand I can I can make an impact and this is what this is my goal. This is what I want to do. I want my own marathon. Julie, you're my biggest role model. <laughs> um, running a marathon and uh, I, I, I want to have my own marathon and I will have it. It's not running. It's something else. So it's despite or because you can. Um, I agree with what um, Silent said about uh, the uh, not being perfect, because I struggle with perfectionism for some reason. So um, just, I need to take that to heart. <laughs> I feel called out a bit. <laughs> but um, I would say to um, not try to be like uh, anybody else, because um, hmm. Cause I dive more into like my own passions and inner, you know, inner struggles and my emotions. And it seems like if I tried to be anybody else than myself, then it wouldn't feel right. Like I wouldn't feel fulfilled as an artist and kind of like the whole point wouldn't matter anymore. So I guess, yeah, just stay true to your passions, I guess. Jonathan, any final thoughts? No, I, I wish I, I want to be helpful, but I don't. 
I wish I had some advice, uh, but. Um, well, if anyone's uh, looking to create a, gr uh, a green room, a, a dark room in their house, we're going to send them your way. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm, I mean, you know, certainly don't let, um, I mean, I guess any hobby can be expensive, uh, but don't, don't let that hold you back from doing what you want to do because there's always, um, I mean, there's always secondhand equipment that you can get. There's always rentals. Um, I mean, you don't have to always have to have the, the newest or the best. Um, whatever helps you get started in, in uh, expressing yourself. Um, there are always options. Thank you. Thank you guys for this. This has been amazing. Um, really, really meaningful uh, and um, so, so special. So I hope the discussion is just beginning and we've inspired uh, more people to talk about art and creativity. Um, I know I am um, excited to con continue pursuing things. I think I'm gonna dig out those pictures of eyes I was developing and <laughs> go back to them. Um, and just really grateful for your time and your energy today. Uh, and I hope everyone has a good nap after this <laughs> um, or Ulrika, a good night's sleep. Um, thank you. So yeah, thank you guys again for sharing. Um, and oops, let me just go ahead and pull up if I can find them. Uh, these slides really quick. We just have uh, patient organizations in the US, of course. We just like to remind everyone of all the great uh, organizations, the Hypersomnia Foundation, a narcolepsy network, as Jonathan mentioned, that has a great event tomorrow, um, Project Sleep, that's us, and Wake Up Narcolepsy. And there are wonderful international organizations, and we do have, a, a, I think, what, 20, 31 of them listed now on the World Narcolepsy Day page. So please get in contact and check out all of their great efforts as well. Um, and just again, thank you, everybody, for tuning in today. Um, and uh, please sign up for our Nerd Alert e-updates on um, our website. We will have a toolkit coming out uh, soon and um, check out also, we have podcasts about past episodes on our website, um, project-sleep.com. So um, just a big thanks again, everybody and uh, rest well, and we'll see you next time. Bye Thank for now. Bye. Bye.